Welcome and thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us and for joining us in a discussion about music and the mind. Um, how many of you have come to either the concert or one of the uh, presentations today? Oh, good, good, good. But some of you are here actually just having come to hear this particular talk. Is that correct? How many of you are just, my goodness, okay, what Do a Do you draw. think that's because we're free? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, that's good, too. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your own music and artistic backgrounds first? Well, I'll start. Um, I was fortunate to grow up in a family where music was just something that you did. It was a part of life. My father had been a folk song collector in North Carolina. Uh, he was trained as a classical violinist, but he turned into a fiddler and loved bluegrass. And in my house, when I, when I was growing up, there was no television, so what were you going to do in the evening? You played music, and if you didn't have something to play, you felt pretty left out. So Well, but you're also a composer, you play piano, guitar, and you sing. Uh, and what, didn't you write your first piece for the organ at five or six years old? Uh, yeah, I was five. See, he's being very, very humble. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Murphy. So, uh, you know, unlike Francis, I actually didn't grow up with music in the house, but I was really blessed to have uh, parents who valued music greatly. My mother noticed that I was drumming on everything when I was a little kid, including often on her head. And so she decided <laughs> <laughs> that if she enrolled me in percussion classes, it might actually literally save her skull. So that's what she did. And she enrolled me in murdungam classes. And murdungam is a percussion instrument that's used in South Indian classical music. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's related somewhat to the tabla, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, but it's a cylindrical instrument that's played with your fingers on both sides. My sister began training at the same time in, as a classical South Indian vocalist, and so she and I would perform together often throughout my childhood. Uh, I will tell you that in the beginning I was resistant to going to classes and to practicing, but now I look back on it and I am so grateful to my parents for opening up an entire world of music to me, and it's been uh, just an incredible gift. And can you tell us about your actual expertise as scientists and doctors and, and how that, and if that's the musical training has had any effect on that at all? So at the moment, I have the privilege of serving as the director of the National Institutes of Health, which is the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world, located in its headquarters in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, just about a half hour drive from here. Uh, I have the privilege of overseeing a program that has incredible diversity of its activities, everything from very basic science uh, to clinical trials of new treatments for cancer or diabetes. That's and a big orchestra, isn't it? That's, that's a, a really, really big orchestra. Your conductor, I can you. tell. Uh, yeah, the score sometimes gets uh, bigger <laughs> than will fit on the podium. But it is an incredible opportunity right now because science is moving so quickly. There's so many things we're figuring out. And one of the reasons that uh, you and I, Renee, have had the chance to get to know each other and work on programs like this very one, which has just been amazing, is because neuroscience, the understanding how the brain works, uh, is so rapidly moving forward. And there's a lot we have to say to each other about how music is interpreted by the brain and how we produce music uh, in our own thoughts and our own creativity. It's just a wonderful coming together. So having grown up with music all around me, uh, having uh, you know, the experience when I need to unwind of playing the guitar or sitting down at the piano because it's my own music therapy for myself. Uh, I'm really happy that these parts of my own loves have come together in this way. And I think that's true of an awful lot of scientists. When you talk to people who are really at the top of their field in science, it's amazing how many of them are musicians too. It is remarkable. I found that in my own career as I travel the world, I never have trouble finding the best doctor in any given town because they know who we are as classical musicians or as musicians in general. It's extraordinary. And you improvise, which I think is so great. Dr. Charles Lim is here and he's giving a talk later on about the power of improvisation in terms of creativity and brain health. So please put that on your calendar for this evening. And Dr. Murthy, you discovered dance. I love this story. Could you repeat this for us? Well, sure. Uh, when I was a medical resident in Boston working really long hours before they really, really started cracking down on the hours <laughs> restrictions in residency. During that time, I, I would come home from these long call nights and uh, you know, having spent 36, 40 hours sort of straight working. Uh, and you know, I would sort of plop into bed and I would just be exhausted and I'd get up the next morning. I really I wouldn't feel that much uh, more rested, honestly. Uh, and until one day when I was walking back home from uh, being on call for, again, 36 hours and I passed by a dance studio 
And unlike many dance classes, which are, you have to sign up for all eight weeks or 10 weeks of classes, this one offered drop-in classes. And I said, well, for somebody with an erratic schedule, maybe this might work for me. Now, I had never thought of myself as a dancer, but I, in, in my sort of post-call induced haze, I made a decision to actually go inside. And I think the fact that I was you know, post-call, because maybe I wouldn't have made that decision had I been fully rested and had my <laughs> defenses up. <clears throat> but I went in and basically that's what introduced me to salsa dancing. And I spent the next several years uh, actually just delving more deeply into salsa. I just really enjoyed being out of my mind and into my body. And I found that that really opened up my creativity. It actually enabled me to be better rested because it recognized that what I needed in fact to be rested was not just sleep, but I needed inspiration, and that's what I found in dance. And I love that you actually incorporated some of these values into your work as Surgeon General, that the messaging had to do with holistic, the whole person. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah, you know, when we, when I began my tenure as Surgeon General, I, I spent about two to three months traveling around the country listening to people <clears throat> and asking them uh, what they wanted from me and what could I do to help. Uh, and in the process of having those conversations, I heard just incredible things. But what I heard from people is that they were struggling with their health and they wanted to be healthier, but they didn't always know what to do. And I'll say what really concerned me uh, is I came away from those conversations feeling that we are a country that has tremendous potential, but that is being held back by pain. And I'm not talking about just physical pain. I'm talking about a deeper emotional pain that people are feeling. And this is in rural and urban areas. It's among people who are rich and poor. It's among people who are ethnic minorities and people who are not. Uh, and the real question I began asking myself is what is the deeper source of that pain? Where is it coming from? And what does science tell us about how we can address it? You know, this is a problem I thought of also when I was a doctor in Boston taking care of patients. I recognized pretty quickly, as I think all doctors do, that there are some places that medicines cannot reach. And there are parts of us that can't be accessed with traditional therapies. We need a different tool to get there. We need a different language, if you will. And what is so beautiful about music is that music is a different language. It has the power to reach people in deep places where sometimes speech or even touch can't. So medicine really pushed me to think about what other languages we have uh, at our disposal uh, to, part, you know, to contribute to the process of healing. And I came to realize that not just music, but really the arts more broadly, are an incredibly rich and untapped source of that healing. Oh, couldn't be better said. We, we are so benefited by what's happened in medicine in the last century plus. It's extraordinary when I, when I think about um, all of the, the benefits that we have now. So why, you know, we met at a dinner party two years ago. For some of you who don't know this story, Dr. Francis Collins and I were at, well, you, you tell it so well about what the dinner party represented and how it's led us to this conjoining of these two huge institutions. Well, maybe it was a good example of how music can bring people together when they didn't expect necessarily that that was going to be possible because this was a dinner party uh, which was held on a Saturday night in the summer, uh, which was it happened to be uh, the Saturday after the Supreme Court had concluded their activities uh, for that particular season. And there had been three major decisions, I won't tell you what they were, that particular week where the court was very significantly split. Uh, and at this dinner party uh, were three Supreme Court justices, and they had not been on the same side of this. Uh, well, except for, I guess, Anthony Kennedy, who was in the middle. So, uh, and, and it was a little tense, I think. Uh, all of everybody trying to unwind, uh, but maybe carrying some residue of what had happened that week. In there a wasn't a lot of eye contact that night, as no. I recall. <laughs> not, not a lot. And there was, uh, after dinner, a, a band that was not particularly spectacular, and somehow I had brought my guitar, and uh, somehow Renee was there, so I had to ask her to sing, and although we had never sung anything before. And the way in which that affected the mood of that group, it was just magical. And it's such a typical example, I think, of how music can bring people together. Music gets into your brain in a way that taps into those deep emotions about bonding with people, about longing, about love, about all those things that sometimes get a little far away from you and music brings you there. Spirituality, is it any wonder that spiritual experiences are often uh, happening at the time of great musical uh, experience as well? I think there's a connection. So I don't mean to overstate that we had a spiritual experience, but it was still a pretty significant example of how 
that kind of music can change Shared. the whole environment. And well, and I, I find it so extraordinary. You know, so many scientists have kind of quietly said to me in the last two days that this, is, this experience is validating their work, the work of the research, et cetera, and that this is often considered a soft science. But now that the NIH, that you and the NIH have taken this on with the workshop, which I'm going to ask you about, why music from amongst all the other art therapies, and why now? Well, I think the answer to that is a wonderful confluence. Uh, one part of that is the advances in neuroscience, which are moving at a pace unprecedented, where we now have the ability with some of these new technologies to actually visualize what the brain is doing in people who are having experiences, some of them sort of profound emotional experiences based on music, for instance. So um, when you sang last night the song to the moon, I got cold chills, and I bet an awful lot of other people in the place did. I thought I was going to melt down. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I also know that I was releasing dopamine on my ventral striatum, because that's what, <laughs> that's what happens when you have that kind of an emotional experience to music. We didn't know that until pretty recently, and that, that's just an example of the way in which, by studying the impact of music, whether listening or producing, we are learning so much about how the brain works. And Renee, you contributed to that, uh, as people who were there last night knows, by putting yourself into an MRI scanner for not 15 minutes, but two hours, while you sang and then thought about singing, and I don't know what else went on for two hours, but it must have been <laughs> a long, long haul, so that you could be contributing to this database of understanding what is the brain doing in the circumstance of a world-class singer. How do you do that? Which parts of the brain are activated? That's pretty amazing. Well, and I found, too, first of all, it was two hours of an experiment that had to be repeated enough times for it to be validated. Uh, and I discovered, too, that the powers of concentration are greater for imagining, for, for the creative imagining of doing something rather than doing it because, as everyone said, I'm skilled at singing, so I didn't have to think about it quite so much <laughs> in that part. But, you know, this sort of brings us back. You know, you were talking a little bit, Dr. Murthy, about what the country needs. I mean, can you speak, a, what, would you, what would your now prescription be for our country? We have In terms a of health, I mean, yeah. just the larger <laughs> wellness. Thank you just for narrowing it. Trying to keep it focused. Keeping me on safe ground here. Keep it clean. <laughs> you know, the, what really concerns me the most and what could make, I think, the biggest difference in the trajectory of our country uh, is a focus on improving emotional well-being in America. We talk a lot about physical well-being, um, but what we talk a lot less about, both in the hospital and outside the hospital and the community, is about the importance and power of emotional well-being. I was in a room uh, in Philadelphia with 400 people uh, a few months ago, and I asked them the following question. I said, do you think of emotions as a source of weakness or a source of power? And nearly every single hand went up saying that emotions were a source of weakness. Now, what's striking to me about that is that the people who know otherwise are certainly artists, but also elite athletes. Every athlete knows that to really succeed and be at the top of your game, it's not just enough to go to the gym, but you also need to focus on your emotional well-being and on your mental game. They know that's what makes the difference between a good player and a great player. And as we think about our country in the future, our emotional well-being, it turns out, has a big impact on our health, but it also has an impact on our school performance, on our productivity at work, on our civic engagement, on, on a whole range of things that we deeply care about. And you can start to understand the, the reasons why when you look at the drivers of emotional well-being. Now, some people will say, well, there are a lot of factors that are contributing to the poor emotional well-being or chronic stress like in our country, and those are poverty, the experience of discrimination, violence in our communities, and change uh, just more broadly. But while we have to work on the external circumstances, there are also internal tools that science tells us we can equip people with that can help them improve their emotional well-being. And one of the most powerful is actually social connection. And this is actually where music comes in. Because social connection, it turns out, is an incredible driver of emotional well-being and health. To the converse of that is that isolation is a big risk factor for disease. People who People who categorize themselves as lonely live shorter lives. In fact, the mortality impact 
of loneliness is equivalent to the mortality impact of smoking or obesity. That's how powerful loneliness is. It also contributes to inflammation in our body, increases our risk of heart disease, our risk of dementia, and a host of other illnesses that we care about. But music actually has the power to build social connection and to do so in various ways. The creation of music, the process of creating music is a powerful way of bringing people together. The experience that I and so many people had last night uh, listening to both of you and so many other talented artists perform, that was an incredibly powerful uh, moment of unity that I felt with these people all around me who I had never met. Uh, but also we learned uh, last night and through science that even listening to music also has an influence on our oxytocin levels in the brain, which contribute to our experience of creating bonds of trust. Uh, and so we have to think about this, and I think about this a lot, because if we really want to improve health, we have to address the root, root cause of illness, and that is emotional well-being. And music, it turns out, is a powerful tool for cultivating that emotional well-being. I, you know, I love that because, you know, and I, I have to say we now have good dinner party language, oxytocin and dopamine. I'm very excited to expand my vocabulary, I have to say. Um, but in thinking about this, uh, I, I always say that performing arts centers should be capitalizing on the fact that we offer a shared experience. That it's not just, you know, come and, and sit in awe of whatever performance is being occurred, but share build a community around what it is that we're presenting. Can you talk about all of us, because you're about to embark on an extraordinary, extraordinary um, initiative. Yeah, I will. I just want to say one other thing, though, about what Vivek is very, I think, powerfully explaining is the social aspect of music. It's useful to think about why do our brains respond to music, and, and what is that all about? Uh, it does seem more and more clear that we probably um, had music before we had speech. It's hard to prove that. Uh, Charles Lim showed a picture of a flute made from a, a bird's uh, leg bone that was probably 30,000 years old. It's hard to look further back and say, what was music like? But now that we have pictures of the brain that shows that the brain has a different area of the auditory cortex that responds to music than responds to speech, that tells you this has been really important for a very long time. Why would that be? Uh, why would this ability to produce and respond to music have provided us with some kind of survival advantage? I mean, that would be the conclusion you'd have to draw. And I think it must be in this space of music as a force to bring us together. Whether it's a force to bring us together to grieve, to celebrate, or maybe to get ready to go to war, music has that potential to activate your brain in a way that words simply cannot do, and to give you comfort, to give you a, a sense of relief, a sense of belonging to something, that's powerful. And what you're saying is that we've lost a lot of that. And that the sense now of isolation, which probably also results in an absence of that kind of shared musical experience, because you gotta be with somebody to share, uh, is contributing perhaps to the malaise uh, and the sense uh, of discouragement that so w widely seems to be around us. So again, I think that says if we're looking for a prescription uh, for our current circumstance, maybe that is a good place to put more emphasis and I hope what we're doing here at this particular conference in a small way uh, sends that message. You asked about all of us and maybe there's a way this fits together. All of us which actually started its um, very test launch last week, uh, aims to enroll one million Americans in a prospective long-term study of health and illness. This is for everybody, so that's why it's called all of us, uh, to sign up for. The full launch will happen this fall, so if you want to uh, pay attention uh, to some of those announcements and think about signing up, please do. The idea here is to ask these million ind individuals to be our partners in trying to understand what really are the factors that contribute to good health or if illness strikes to the management of that illness in an optimum way. And we don't know the answers to that in many ways. This is precision medicine where we're trying to get really detailed information but also understand individual differences. So those one million folks, will, because uh, they're interested in being partners, uh, will be invited uh, to contribute information about themselves, 
Uh, they will give a blood sample. They'll have their genomes completely sequenced, which is a pretty exciting thing to contemplate for a million people. They will have uh, the opportunity to walk around with wearable sensors uh, and see what's happening on a daily basis as far as their body's performance and their environmental exposures. And they will be available for all kinds of follow-up studies to see what kinds of things are contributing to health or illness. So one of my dreams is, if you had those million folks right now, and they're excited about research, and they want to be asked other things, let's find out what role music is playing in their lives and how that's contributing to their general sense of well-being, because we've never had the chance to do something like that on that scale before. So the NIH had an extraordinary workshop in January, and one of the, one of the thoughts was to this, this idea of nesting. So it would be to embed, I think, certain research ideas into this study, as you just mentioned. Exactly. <clears throat> so you might not want all one million people to take part in every follow-up study, but if you have a million people who are interested, then you can do a nested study where you study maybe a few hundred thousand or a 20 or 30,000 and get an answer that otherwise would have taken you 10 years. Maybe you can do it in two months. It's incredible. Um, and can you talk, uh, Dr. Murthy, about the, the Surgeon General's role? How, could you take a study or information from a study like that and use it as you're in your work? Well, absolutely. Uh, I often tell people, well, before I begin any talk, when I was Surgeon General, I'd always tell people what my job was because I realized everyone had heard of the Surgeon General from cigarette warning labels and from alcohol containers that That's have warning it. labels. I know, exactly. <laughs> but they had no idea what I actually did. Uh, and in fact, most commonly, I was mistaken for being an airline pilot at the, uh, at the <laughs> airport. <laughs> but it turns out the Surgeon General has two main responsibilities. One is to oversee the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, which is one of the six, one of the seven, sorry, uniformed services in the federal government, along with the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, et cetera. But the other uh, role is to provide the public with scientific information about health so people can make good decisions for themselves and for their families. And the results of the study that Dr. Collins is talking about is going to be incredibly interesting. Uh, it's going to help us really expand our understanding of so many different areas of health. But when we think about the results that come out of this, this is exactly the kind of information and data that the Surgeon General can actually take out to the country and share more broadly. Um, and I want to emphasize how important this is because the creation of research is one thing. The dissemination of research, as uh, Francis knows well, is a whole other challenge that we have to deal with. Um, it takes a very long time, especially in the world of medicine, to get ideas translated from research into practice. But we also have an important need, an urgent need right now, to make sure that people in the general public also understand accurate information uh, about science. There are a lot of myths uh, you know, out there about what science says and doesn't sa say. When I first actually took office, there was a measles outbreak, and one of the first things I had to, to deal with was a lot of misconceptions about the measles vaccine uh, and uh, links to autism, when it turns out there is no link to autism, but many people thought there was. So it's very important that we have those voices for communication. And I raise this not to say that the Surgeon General needs to be the only voice for that, but in fact to say just the opposite which is that we need more voices than ever to be standing up for science, for the truth, disseminating accurate information so people can make good decisions for themselves yes, and their families. Yes. Thank you. Um, and to that end about this sort of difficulty of, of bridging uh, the research with practice, can, can you talk a little bit about the workshop and why music therapy was such an important part of that? Yeah, I'd love to. And again, Renee, much credit to you uh, for the way you've helped me think through this over the course of this last year as we've been partners in this. But I started to say earlier, one of the motivations from NIH's perspective uh, to get into this idea of music in the mind was the development of new tools for neuroscience that give us ways of imaging the brain when the brain is doing some really interesting things. But the other part of this is seeing the field of music therapy, which has been around uh, since World War II, maybe World War I, uh, having increasing opportunities to be applied to all kinds of disorders, many of which we've seen demonstrated in workshops even today, and dramatic outcomes, but yet still an uncertainty about exactly how does that fit together with what's going on in the neuroscience of the brain. Could we bring these areas together and further enrich the basic science by the study of music and further enrich the clinical aspect of music therapy by bringing the neuroscience alongside? The workshop aimed to try to see what we could do in that space, and so we invited music therapists, we invited musician performers, and we invited some spectacular neuroscientists, 
And we all tried to understand each other's language, and by the end of a day and a half, we were pretty excited about what we had discovered might be there as a potential to bring these fields together. And I gotta give a shout out to the music therapists because they really taught me a lot. Can I see hands for all the music therapists who are here? Yay! Some of these folks came from all over the country uh, to be part of this discussion. And I think for them, this was a moment of a recognition that what they've been doing uh, is something that we are all pretty interested in and want to try to see, can we partner up <coughs> to make this field even stronger? So at the, at the end of that workshop, we came up with a number of things that we might do next, uh, and that would include maybe building teams that would include a basic neuroscientist with a music therapist, consider what kind of trials we might do to try to identify rigorously what things work and what don't work, try to get the outcomes really nailed down, maybe develop what we would call biomarkers of response to music therapy that would give you a sense about whether something has really produced the outcome that you want without having to wait a long time to find that out. Those are things we do in other areas. We hadn't really thought about doing them in this space, and now we are. So I, I was amazed, for instance, if you could explain to the audience what what, what the nature of research is, why it's important, why it has to be rigorous, because music therapy, as you said, has been around for 70 years, and music therapists are saying, hey, we know this works. We see the videos that have gone viral. We think it works. So what is it this about this research? I was so amazed at how granular it is. Yeah. You know, I thought of it like a wall made up of tiny, tiny little bricks, and if you have to build it up from the bottom up. If you could sort of help us understand that. Well, that's the nature of research. You come up with an idea, you think it might work, you try it out, sometimes in a very small scale way, and see if you can actually get some encouragement your idea is right. And if it does, then sometimes you stop there, but maybe that's not the, the right thing to do. We have misled ourselves so many times down through history in terms of interventions that we thought were beneficial, and then ultimately it turned out they weren't. And you don't even have to go back a few hundred years to find examples of that. We're probably doing some of those things even now. So from the perspective of somebody who really wants to have the evidence to document whether some intervention is successful, there's not really a substitute, once you think you have a good idea, to designing a trial, to really test it in a way. And ideally, that trial even ought to be randomized, where you have people who are in a similar circumstance, and some of them get the intervention, and some of them get some control intervention. And then you ought to watch closely and see what happens over the course of time in terms of whether it changes outcomes. I know that sounds sort of cold and heartless when you're talking about something like music therapy, but ultimately, that's how you find out what works. And Frankly, it isn't just the experiments where it worked that you get excited about. You should also get excited about the ones where it showed it didn't work, and we can stop doing that one and do something different that might work better. All of that is just adding to a foundation of evidence that we want all fields to have. So when we sit in front of somebody who has a need, who need, has a need for healing, we can say, we're going to offer you this because we have the evidence that it's going to help you. God, that's so exciting. And, you know, uh, you talked a lot about l last year about joy and about meditation. And I'm wondering if meditation, as you said, it works so well for students, if, that, if music and meditation have something in common. Well, I, they do. I, I believe that music and meditation both have the common effect of quietening the noise in our lives. And we have a lot of noise in our life right now that may come from things that are happening in our families, in our workplaces. Um, if you are um, in the unfortunate position of being somebody who consumes news a lot, <laughs> then you may have also a lot of noise in your life because there's a lot of noise in the headlines, a lot of reasons to feel anxious like when you read the paper. And this is not something new. Uh, this has been happening for years. Uh, but we have a lot of noise in our life. And that noise contributes to anxiety, which is a form of stress. And that chronic stress actually leads to chronic inflammation in our body and causes disease and illness, not to mention reduces our performance uh, in life. Uh, so meditation is powerful and music are powerful because they, they help quieten that noise. Uh, in the case of meditation, it quiets our mind. In the case of music, it takes us to a different place that can actually be more fulfilling, more healing, uh, and more wholesome. And it, as we think about this, and I was thinking about this deeply last night in the midst of the, the concert, uh, you know, I've, since leaving office, I have uh, continue to be really passionate about how to improve emotional well-being for our country. 
And I really want to make that a major focus of what I do in the future because it's so important for us to build that movement for emotional well-being in our country. And I've been thinking about what's in our toolbox. What does science tell us we can use? Meditation is one of them, but it's not the only one. We know physical activity has a powerful effect acutely and long-term on emotional well-being. We know sleep has a really big impact. Social connection, extremely powerful in improving emotional well-being. Um, music, also very powerful. And as I was sitting there last night, I thought to myself, we have to include music and the arts in our toolbox for how to improve emotional well-being. So thank you for that inspiration last night, both of you. Thank you. And can you, can you talk about your time ahead now? I mean, you, you, I, you, we spoke briefly on the phone, and you said you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about how you feel now that you've stepped down as, as Surgeon General, and I'd love to know how you'd characterize your time as Surgeon General and what you plan to do in the future, what you're thinking about. Sure. Well, I, you know, I had two and a half of the best years of my life as Surgeon General. I'm incredibly grateful. Uh, for having had the opportunity to serve. And I will tell you that I was perhaps the most surprised of anyone that I was asked to serve uh, in the first place. Uh, this was not a position that I had sought out or ever dreamed that I would have uh, the position to, or the opportunity to contribute to. Uh, and frankly, just by background, I was probably the last person or one of the uh, a more unlikely candidates. You know, my, uh, my dad was uh, destined to be a poor farmer in a village in India. You know, if life was governed entirely by probability, I should be growing coconuts, rice, and tamarind in a small village in South India right now. But it turns out, uh, as I have been grateful to find, that you know, dreams sometimes take hold in unlikely places. And my father, in the midst of the bracing poverty that he was experiencing, uh, not even having enough to buy pencils for school or shoes to wear on his feet, uh, in the midst of that poverty, he found himself dreaming of opportunity in a land far away. He found himself dreaming of America. And I was fortunate 40 years ago that my parents had the chance to come here with the hope, the simple hope, uh, although the profound one, that this would be a place where their kids, my sister and me, would be judged not by the basis of the color of our skin or the fact that we had a funny sounding name, but by the fact that we had ideas and that we were willing to work hard. And for me to be uh, offered the opportunity to serve as Surgeon General, uh, to look out for the health of an entire nation, um, having just a generation ago uh, had a father who was a poor farmer in a small village in India, that speaks to the power and the promise of America, and I'm incredibly grateful for it. Fabulous. And as I think about the future, you know, as I mentioned, I, I feel even more committed now than ever before to improving the health of our country. I feel more optimistic about America now than on the day that I began. And the reason I do is again, not because of what I read you know, in the media, it's because what I heard directly from people all across our country, people who in their stories and in their, in, you know, in, in their own lives, they reflected an optimism, uh, a courage, if you will, that is so important uh, to the future of our country. These are people who, in many cases, faced incredible hardship, but they didn't give up. Uh, they still retained hope. Uh, that they could be a better life ahead for them and their kids. They still wanted to contribute to making their community better for the other people who live there. In those stories, in those people who I met, their courage, uh, their values, and their kindness is ultimately what I believe is going to move our country forward. You know, I have believed for a long time uh, that there are fundamentally two qualities that, or emotions rather, that drive our decisions. And those are love or fear. And you know, love has its many manifestations, like kindness, joy, uh, compassion. Uh, fear has its manifestations as well, like anger, uh, cynicism, insecurity, rage. And right now, the world is locked in a struggle between love and fear. And the question is, which way will the balance tip? And what is so powerful about music and the arts is that those manifestations of love that I mentioned inspiration, kindness, compassion, these are all feelings that are evoked by the experience of music and the arts. It turns out that music and the arts can be what help tilt our world away from fear and towards love. And if we can do that, then we can build a country and a world that is prosperous, that is kind, uh, and that is one that our children uh, ultimately truly deserve. And that's what I want to contribute to during my life uh, after Surgeon General. Thank you, thank you. You know, and I, I think that is so incredibly true. And I, uh, because I come from an operatic tradition, which is build storytelling into the musical presentation, 
Um, I think we can also say that the history of art in terms of whether you're talking about Shakespeare or Bach or, or all the great um, operas, in fact, tell that same story of, of human conflict, of human resolution, of what great leadership is. And can I tell you, I'm so inspired to hear two of our greatest leaders in the world who are, are really um, responsible for our health uh, talk about well-being and about a much more holistic sense of what health is, you know, because I imagined that the NIH's job as an entire unit was to cure cancer, and yet here you are, right? I mean, so I'm a layperson, and here you are um, building in a future that looks at us as human beings, a quality of life. Can you just briefly talk about um, STEM versus STEAM, for instance, or what a future care facility would look like, or a future corporate world? What, how how should we be living our lives from day to day based on what you are doing and learning? Well, one thing, again, going back to what we've learned uh, from science is that the opportunity for children uh, to be exposed to the arts and specifically to music has powerful consequences lifelong. Uh, Nina Krauss this morning in her wonderful workshop uh, showed some of the data there that that kind of musical training not only uh, gives that child a gift that they're going to be able to derive personal pleasure from o over the course of a lifetime, it also enhances uh, their ability uh, to learn in other ways about other things. And certainly that kind of scientific data I is an another reason why if we're the National Institutes of Health, uh, we should be thinking about health in a very holistic way. And yes, we are going to cure cancer along the way too. That's a big part of our agenda. But people with cancer are also struggling and they're needing healing in all kinds of other ways uh, that perhaps that latest cancer immunotherapy won't directly take care of in all of the possible ways that need to be attended to. I, I confess, I'll, I'll be a little bit autobiographical, before I went into medicine, uh, I was uh, focused instead on physical science. My PhD is in quantum mechanics. Uh, it was very much sort of reductionist approach, trying to understand everything in terms of mathematics of how atoms and molecules behaved. And I ultimately felt there was something missing there and, and went off to medical school, which I was rather poorly prepared for, uh, because of this hunger for the human connection. And the human connection Cl clearly won me over rather quickly as being a lot more than second order differential equations. Uh, it, was, it was about the whole person, about the emotional side, the spiritual side. And I went from being somebody who thought that was all kind of gobbledygook uh, to actually becoming a believer. Uh, and that's all wound up in what we're talking about here uh, in terms of the role of music in our, in our daily experiences. One of the most touching moments I heard this morning was uh, DeForia Lane, who's a music therapist in Cleveland, uh, talking about some of the ways in which she had reached out to patients in that hospital system. But at the end of her presentation, she didn't tell us, she sang to us. And she sang a very simple song that I guess she had heard from someone else. I hear music in the air, three times over. I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. That, that was so really beautiful. got to me. That was so beautiful. And, you know, in terms of quality of life, too, and, and you talked about last year about the will to live, that that's a real thing. That's, n that's not a, an imagined thing. No, I mean, a anyone who has cared for uh, patients in a hospital or uh, people who have had loved ones who have been in the hospital have come, probably come to realize that you can measure all the numbers, uh, the blood pressure, the heart rate, the you know, oxygenation in, you know, in the blood, and, and so on and so forth. And those can help you predict whether someone's going to do better or worse. But one's own will to live is a powerful predictor as well. And most doctors and nurses come to realize that very quickly. Uh, when a patient has given up, uh, that's often a very bad sign because our will is what helps recruit so much of our resources, including our own immune system, uh, to come to the fight, if you will, uh, and to sustain ourselves. And that's to me why it's important that we think about the will to live, not just in those who are ill and in the hospital, but among all of us. We have to strengthen that will to live. It's not only sufficient to just be okay. You know, when we talk about emotional well-being, most people think we're talking about mental illness. 
And our focus for far too long has been on just ensuring people don't have mental illness. Now, it's important to address mental illness. Let me be very clear about that. It's something we don't talk about enough that we have to focus much more attention and resources on. But our goal should not be just to be free of mental illness. Uh, it should be to function at the optimal end of our scale, to be at the top, uh, our, our peak state emotionally, so that we can do more, experience more, and contribute more. You know, when I think about, I'm sure that everyone in this room has had a relationship of some sort, either a romantic relationship or a friendship. And when you think about what kind of relationship you want in your future, no one ever says, gosh, you know, I just really want to have an adequate relationship. Just really, <laughs> just looking for something that's not pathological. You know, <laughs> people usually say, I want an extraordinary relationship. And they should say that. And that's what we, be, should we, we should be aiming for in terms of emotional health. So the will to live is powerful, but we need to think much more broadly about how we strengthen the inspiration in people's lives, which fuels that will to live, and how we do that for everyone. My hope for the future is that health systems will not just be hospitals and clinics, but there'll be networks extended throughout our community that in fact focus on prevention, that contribute to the will to live, and that think really broadly about what contributes to health. You mentioned STEAM versus STEM. One of the things that concerns me and bothers me a little bit is when People talk about, pejoratively sometimes, about sort of real sciences and the soft sciences, with the assumption being that the stuff in the soft category, that's it's sort of fluff, it's, uh, it's not really real stuff, or at least it's far inferior uh, to the hard sciences. But really, there should only be one distinction, science and not science. And if we pursue uh, research and find evidence that something works, then that should be science. And as we think about how to create a culture of prevention in our country, I think we have to redefine uh, health, we have to redefine what hospitals do, and my hope is that one day in the future we can become a country that is as good at preventing illness as we are at treating it. That will be a truly healthy and strong nation. Oh, fabulous, thank you so much. So, I, I wanna ask uh, Dr. Collins if, if really you think you will further this work and continue to try and, and bridge this world of music, music therapy, and research. That is our goal, and we have to figure out what's the best way uh, to encourage that to happen. Certainly, this comes at an interesting time because we are engaged, uh, have now been underway for three years uh, in a 10-year effort to actually understand how the human brain works, how those circuits in your brain are capable of doing amazing things. And we still have some big gaps in our understanding this is, after all, the most complicated structure in the known universe, so you have to forgive us that we haven't quite figured it out yet. I mean, there are fundamental things we don't understand yet. We don't know how you actually lay down a memory and retrieve it in terms of exactly what's going on there with the molecules and the electricity. We don't understand how when you hear somebody's voice down the hallway that you maybe haven't seen in two years, you already know who that is after the first few words. That's a very impressive amount of processing and all kinds of other inputs. And of course, we don't understand how when you listen to a particular piece of music, it affects you profoundly. We can say some sketchy things about that. We're gonna figure that out. Some people are a little worried that our brains aren't complicated enough to actually understand our brains, but we're gonna have computers to help us here. <laughs> That's good. I love that. Well, listen, I'm speaking of, of the brain, I'm very encouraged by the plasticity of the brain that we've I'm, I plan on learning a lot uh, and more than I think I probably thought I could in this stage of life. And I welcome you all, hopefully, to Dr. Ani Patel's session, which is coming up, up soon on creative aging. Dr. Charles Lim is giving a session tonight on the power of improvisation and creativity with Esperanza Spaulding uh, and Vijay Iyer. So we have some very exciting programming. I've learned a lot. I hope you've learned a lot, too. Um, and I really want to thank Dr. Collins and Dr. Murphy. Renee, oh, can he's I got add one, one more thing? point. Just we've got wait, one more wait, point. I feel like I have to say that I just have to emphasize that what we're seeing right here, the fact that Renee and Francis have brought us together to build this larger movement around music and health and well-being, this is not something we should take for granted because this is an incredible opportunity and an extraordinary movement that they're seeking to build. Uh, and I just feel very grateful to both of them for, for doing this. But movements are often built by visionary leaders, but they have to be sustained by people on the ground. 
And that's why as all of you leave here, and as you think about how, as you think about the inspiration that you heard from Renee and Francis last night and from all the amazing speakers this morning, as you think about how to continue and contribute to that, uh, I would love it if everyone could think about how they can, number one, start with experiencing music and the arts more in their own life by making it a priority. And second, how they can think about making that an opportunity and experience for people around you uh, as well. Uh, it's in this way that we will actually spread greater health and well-being. And if you believe and understand, as I believe the science tells us, uh, that emotional well-being is in fact a powerful force for our country at a time where we really need it, and if you understand that music can be a powerful force for improving emotional well-being, then it turns out that expanding access to music and the arts could be one of the most powerful and patriotic things that we do. So I would encourage you to build this movement with Francis and Renee, and I will be there right with you, there with you helping out. You're here. Thank right. you so much. Thank you, Vivek.